One of the great teachings from the Zen patriarchs is that to be enlightened is to be intimate with all things. And, and I like the word intimacy so much so that for the last probably 15 years we've called our retreats here in the Washington area Intimacy with Life. Now a very related teaching is that if you have any real preferences and read in by that, if judgments and so on, that puts you a million miles from that intimacy that we so love. Which puts us in a conundrum because we have a longing for connection and intimacy and a strong, strong conditioning to judge. Does that sit well <laughs> or not well? <laughs> okay. So one of the basic principles we run into is that um, in understanding each other is that if we want someone to be different, if we have an idea on what we're hoping be, they'll be or how they should be, in those moments we really can't see who's there. We're seeing our projection of what we want and maybe what's not there. I remember one story of a woman, a physician, who was driving her her young daughter, I think seven years old, home from, from school and the daughter picked up the mother's stethoscope and was looking at it with what seemed to be real interest. So her mom says, oh my heart be still, you know, maybe this is, maybe this is the profession that's meant to be for her, you know. At which point the little girl picks up the um, stethoscope and goes, welcome to McDonald's, can I take your order please? <laughs> So, and that's pretty benign and we all know what it's like with it, whether it's a partner, a child, a parent, a colleague, that when we're living inside how we want them to be, um, we're not seeing clearly and when there's really a strong judgment, you should be different, we've created real separation. Whenever there's a you should, should definitely put up your antennas. You should be different. Painful distance. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to share a story. Um, this is uh, somebody I worked with at a retreat a couple of years ago, a uh, massage therapist, and he came from a, a poor family. Uh, his parents are Irish. He was a bright kid, uh, did real well in school, was on a track for med school. His father worked very, very hard to make it possible. Well, he was a year and a half in to med school when he realized it really wasn't for him. He really didn't want to be there. And he tried to explain it to his dad, but his, his father was, uh, you know, just insistent and threatening. So he cut off and got very defended and there was uh, just a lot of heat and anger between them. He didn't yield, um, but it, it was, it created a lot of um, alienation. So he quit med school and the longer he became, you know, he went into herbs, he ended up becoming a massage therapist. His father was enraged. Then as his life went on, he married a Jamaican woman that created more of a, of a split and he tried a number of times to kind of reach out to his dad but there was a real, there was a wall that was really, uh, could not be broached and um, so his father closed him out and 20 years went by, minimal communication. Then uh, his mother got diagnosed with cancer and uh, it was treatable but terrible protocol and he was visiting a lot and uh, he'd come and he'd you know, he'd bring baskets of raspberries and nature DVDs and so on. Um, his father was formal and distant. Mother appreciated his visits. He, she was having a lot of trouble sleeping, so he started really giving, putting his energy into massages. And one particular day, she had had a really hard night. He was giving her a massage and she kind of you know, he, and he was at one point working on his, her feet and you could see her face, she was really relaxed and, and so on and kind of drifted off to sleep and he turned and saw his father had been watching and his father had tears in his eyes. So he, he went out and walked into the living room where his father was and they just embraced. 
and um, they they talked, and it took a while. I mean, this was not there was a, that kind of sudden opening, and then a kind of a shyness, and that, but it was it cracked open. The wall was crumbling, and and what it you know as we talked about it, and it became so clear that the wall between people can only be sustained. It can only be sustained when instead of communication, we live inside our judgment. But if there's some communication, and it can be verbal or nonverbal, some paying attention, you know, it's said that we are a flow through of information. That's what we are. And when we let it flow through, when we receive information from each other and we give it, we become more than a separate self. We become a part of each other. We know each other. But if we contract into judgment and live in that virtual reality, that story, we're seeing a sliver of somebody, we don't know them, we're not taking in their information, and the wall can go on for decades. So, when I hear reconciliation stories, I'm a real softy. Like, I almost always cry at them. Even if I, like just now when I was telling you, I, I, I've thought about this story a lot, especially this week because I knew I wanted to share it, I could still feel that welling up. And I think the reason is it just seems like such a tragedy that we cut people out of our hearts. It seems so sad that, you know, for them it was two decades. And it also feels so beautiful that it's possible to, to reopen and have communion. And so I'm, I'm talking about grief for the loss of not just the huge estrangements where there's um, the real big cutoffs like this story or, you know, marriages that fail or families that, you know, where somebody doesn't ever reconnect. But I also feel the, the sorrow for all the small ways in daily life. We're not maybe formally estranged, but the resentments and the blames keep us from really loving each other, from that freedom to love without holding back. So often um, I reflect that, you know, if we were at the end of our lives looking back with the perspective would be, and certainly it would be a sorrow at letting the smaller stuff get in the way of loving. So the path to intimacy, that's really what we're exploring, and we'll be exploring it this week and next week, and what I'd like to do this week is explore intimacy in an inner way with our inner life, and then intimacy with each other because to bridge the gap with each other, to be able to do that, it starts with being able to communicate with our inner life. We have to be able to uh, know ourselves, be in touch with ourselves. We now know this more even on a uh, you know, functional, structural level of the brain, that the more that we are able to, we have that proprioceptive awareness that can notice what's going on emotion-wise and name it and feel it in our own body, the more we can register how it is for another person. If we're cut off from ourselves, we can't be intimate with others. Hence we do these trainings. We're not training so we can go off into a cave and um, be solo for the rest of our existence. We do this training so we can be intimate with life, with the loneliness and the mystery and the beauty of what's within us and around us. What I'd like to do as I explore this with you, this kind of pathway to intimacy, is talk about, have the whole filter be communication how when we're paying attention, we're actually in communication with ourselves. And the communication is going on all the time. Every part of us is communicating in some way with other parts of us. And there's blocks, but there's also some things going on, and there's messages that aren't so useful, messages that are useful, but it's going on inside us. If we become more conscious of that communication, we can have it serve 
communion. When it's unconscious and when it gets cut off in certain directions, we end up being fragmented and reactive. So those are a lot, that's a lot of words I would like to kind of see if we can drop into that some. The basic uh, undercurrent that we usually need to explore the message we're usually responding to when we're in trouble is something's wrong and something's wrong with me. Those are the messages. When you're in trouble, when communication isn't flowing, when you're contracting, there's a message going on that you're believing that something's wrong or something's wrong with me. They're the same thing, but they have a little bit more tag in one of them. So maybe just to begin, because I, I talk about this a lot on purpose, this trance we go into of a flawed self, this trance we go into that what I'm feeling is bad and I am bad, okay? So what I've, the reason I wrote Radical Acceptance and even, and with True Refuge, the same point is if we don't recognize that we're caught in that, if we don't have a way to communicate with the parts of us that are believing that, then our life is imprisoned. So a brief reflection, just because this will give you a chance to choose some place you'd like to pay attention to tonight for yourself, which will, I think, brings it alive a little more. If you'd like to close your eyes and pause, check in a little. So the inquiry we begin with, we're beginning by, this is a way of starting to communicate with our experience, is just asking, you know, today, yesterday, right now, am I experiencing this life and accepting what I'm experiencing as it is? Am I accepting my experience of life? Am I accepting myself as I am? Ultimately, they're the same. So what you're exploring, is there anything between me and being at home with my life, with myself? So you're scanning and sensing, is there somewhere that you've tagged as, this is wrong, this is bad, this is not okay? It might be something to do with your health, it might be your experience of somebody else. It might be some behaviors that you're experiencing in yourself that you can't accept. Is there anything between me and being at home with myself, with my life? notice if there's a place in you or some feelings that, that you've in some way tagged as not okay. And just send that message inward that you'll be back. You'll be back to deepen your attention to this. Really, we're here because we want to wake up, which means deepening our attention to the places that might be still in our unconscious, still in trance. So send that message, I'll be back. And if you'd like to open your eyes, you can. When I do, do, I do that reflection a lot, and um, I remember a few weeks ago I, I did it, and I was, I'd been fighting an infection, and um, had kind of, was a bit under the weather, and you know, a little more grim, a li little harder to respond to the calls or the emails and so on. And I've shared sometimes in here that when I'm sick, um, you know, there's, 
I end up finding that I have some dislike for the sick, dragging self. Like, I don't like myself when I'm sick. So not only am I having an aversion to the unpleasantness of the sensations of sick, I don't like the self that's identified as a sick self that's not quite self-pitting but really oppressed, beleaguered, kind of, you know. So um, when I asked that question, you know, is there anything between, it wasn't so much the unpleasantness of being sick, but I found, oh, what's between me and feeling at home is I've kind of turned on that sense of self who's uh, not being a graceful sick person, you know. <laughs> and um, and I, when I could name that, oh, turned on myself, then the next thing that came was, oh, may I be kind? May I be kind to that place? May I be forgiving? May I loosen up? I've been through this so many rounds, can I just you know, be easier on myself. And it was very genuine, it was very spontaneous. As soon as I could see it, then there was a kinder response. But when I was inside it, I was kind of grumbling and sour on my own being, you know. Now, I, I give that as an example because if we look, what is the core principle of transformation, of movement from suffering to freedom? It's this that we pay attention in such a way that our identification loosens. So that rather than being the sick self or the judge of the sick self, by noticing, by naming, I opened into a larger space of awareness. You become the awareness that's aware and not so hitched with a set of feelings or an idea of a self that owns those feelings. If you can understand that and feel that from the inside out, the sense this shift from the something wrong with me, I'm not a good person feeling, to the, the beingness that notices that, it's visceral. You actually feel more spacious. And then there's a lot more access to kindness and to humor and to flexible behaviors and everything. So this, is, this shift is what we're gonna be tracking uh, today and next week when we look at what happens when we start communicating more consciously, what happens when we start noticing and naming something to ourselves and sending messages to ourselves, or letting the place in us speak, something shifts. We're not as trapped inside an experience. So what we find for each of us, is if we start scanning our life and sensing the pattern of, let's say, turning on ourselves the way I did, we start getting a lot more committed. There's, there's a commitment to waking up out of it. We start noticing when it's happening and that's when we commit ourselves to kind of having a fresh relationship with ourselves. And I'm wondering if you just ask, ask yourself, how, if, have I noticed that I relate to myself in a way that's often not friendly and not with a quality of understanding. Can you sense how often you relate to yourself in a way that does not hold yourself with respect? If you start noticing that, there's a natural compassion that arises that wants it different. So I found in working with people over these decades that the key is to have some commitment to relating to ourselves with more love. It says Sri Narsargadatta, uh, one of the teachers I most love, said, he said, all I ask of you is this, make love of yourself perfect. Now, by perfect, he didn't mean this is another standard and don't fail on this one, you know, okay? <laughs> That's not what he meant. What he meant was commit yourself to embracing this life for the sake of happiness and the sake of peace and the sake of freedom because the most important truths are the ones that we most regularly forget. And one of the most important truths is if you can't see and embrace the life that's here, you'll not be able to embrace and find peace 
and happiness in life at large. It starts right here. Make love of yourself perfect. So we think of it within our own being as can we create a more loving environment, can we communicate in a way that, that includes the parts that are estranged? And then if we think of the world, I mean, is it going to be possible to move towards more peace on earth without communication between warring nations or between races or ethnicities or religions? Can we have peace without coming to understand each other? It's not going to happen because of political agreements. It's going to be happening because our hearts understand each other and when we know each other, we don't want to harm each other. Similarly, when we come into relationship with ourselves, we don't want to harm ourselves. So, Coral Young put it this way. He said, our suffering comes from the unseen, unfelt parts of our psyche when we don't know ourselves, when we're not in communication with ourselves. A healing relationship, when we begin to communicate with those parts of our being, when we invite them into the light of awareness, when we say, I see you, what do you need? What's going on? What can I offer you? There's communication. So then the question comes, how come it's so hard? I mean, every one of us here has parts of our being that are not so seen and are not so felt and not so welcomed, right? I mean, we all do. How come it's so hard to start communicating and including, bringing all parts to the table, the peace table, right? And it is hard. And I think a simple way to put it is that we have a conditioning to contract away from unpleasantness. So there's two things we're trying to do. One is that there's a part of us that knows that healing comes by embracing these parts and another part of us is conditioned to go yuck and pull away. That's what's going on, really. And the more injured we've been, the more we get that yuck or the more stressed we are, the more we contract and we're no longer having the wisdom to say, okay, be with this experience. We just flinch. Does that make sense? Okay, here's a a a story to illustrate. This is a a man who was responding to an accident and he was writing out his accident report form and I want to read you what he wrote. He said, your request for additional information in block three of the accident report form, I put in poor planning as the cause of my accident. You said in your letter I should explain more fully. I trust the following details will be sufficient. I'm a bricklayer by trade. One day of the, on the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I discovered that I had 500 pounds of brick left. Rather than carrying them down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel attached to the side of the building. Securing the rope at ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out and loaded the brick into it. Then I went back to the ground and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 500 pounds of bricks. <laughs> you will note in block number 11 of the accident report from that I weigh 135 pounds. <laughs> Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rapid rate up the side of the building. (laughs) In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This explains the fractured skull. (laughs) Slowing slightly, slightly, I continued my ascent, stopping when the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep in the pulley. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of my pain. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel now weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again to my weight in block number 11. (laughs) As you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I again met the barrel coming up. This accounts for the fractured ankle. (laughs) The encounter with the barrel slowed me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell onto the bricks. Fortunately, only my toes were cracked. 
I'm sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the bricks in pain and unable to stand and watching the empty barrel six stories above me, I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. <laughs> this is entitled on knowing when to let go. <laughs> So it's a wild example, but don't we all know how we get tugged around and we make a mistake and we get frustrated and we move faster and then something else goes wrong and, and, it, and it proliferates, okay? This is our reactivity. We pull away from unpleasantness, from shame, from loneliness, from fear, from vulnerability. We pull away. So rather than embracing the unseen, unfelt parts of our being, uh, we push them away, and we do it in a number of ways. You know, we ignore, we neglect, or we judge. But however we're doing it, we've cut off communications. And when we cut off communications, we contract. We're not hearing their message, we're not hearing what's needed, we're not able to respond to what's needed. And so what happens is we're cut off not only from our sense of being able to respond, we're cut off from the place of wisdom that knows in a broader way how to navigate. We're in reactivity, just like this guy who's just kind of zipping up and down the side of a building, right? Now, I think of this as being at war with ourselves in a way. Because whenever we neglect a part of our being, we don't really listen to the loneliness, or we cover over the fear with busyness, or in some way we, we feel the shame but we try to just keep on improving ourselves. Whenever we do that, we're actually um, in some way cutting ourselves off from a part of ourselves. It's, we're at war. And, and clearly some people suffer from this contraction and being at war with parts of themselves more than others. Some people have more strong aversive experiences and then more aversion towards the self. And that can be explained by genetics and, and, you know, infinite causes. It can be explained by culture. It can be explained by our familial situation. I, mo I, I, I put a lot into, you know, how we were treated by our own caretakers. And I think that this is, is a very big generalization, but to the degree that the people that took care of us were able to communicate with us, and at first, of course, it's fully nonverbal, but to a degree that there was attunement. So as a, a very young being, our facial expression and our sounds and our movements expressed what we needed and there was somebody listening and responding, that's communication. To the degree that that communication was fluid and attuned, we actually learned to listen to and respond to ourselves. To the degree that there was severed belonging, there was a lack of communication. Our parents, maybe through, through no fault of their own, were distracted, afraid, preoccupied, caught in anger, caught in fear. To that extent, we end up not knowing how to be with ourselves if they weren't with us. You know, I'm reading a... Uh, a really wonderful book right now. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow by David Kahneman. And I'm curious how many of you are reading that or have heard about it? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, really, really interesting book. And you'll probably hear me refer to it for the next eight months because I think that's how long it'll take to read it. <laughs> uh, it, it really explains in, in a profound, intelligent way what shapes our decisions and our judgments and describes two basic systems in us, and one's the fast thinking system, and it's correlated generally to the limbic system. This is the survival system that doesn't have time to think things out, to, to have us move through things. It uses intuition and impressions and um, beliefs, associations. It's driven by emotion and it's quick. And then we've got our slow system, which you might say has to do more with the frontal cortex where there's deliberate thinking and analyzing and it's logical and also mindfulness, the bigger perspective. We need both. 
and they're both in communication with each other. The fast thinking informs the slower thinking, the slower thinking says, hmm, is this true? How do we deal with this? And sends a message back to the fast system. So there's, there's a looping of, of um, communication going on. Now, when we get stressed, when we get really stressed, so an old charged pattern appears, you know, we've been criticized or we make a mistake or feel rejected or out of control or some craving comes up, when it's, when it's intense, the fast system often takes over. And again, we're like that guy that was just being tugged around by the rope and the bricks, that we lose contact. He said, I lost my presence of mind. We lose what in this book is called the slow system, we lose access to mindfulness, to wisdom, to vision, to perspective. And for many of us, depending on our early childhood experience and our biochemistry, because we encountered so much stress, we're much more permanently on that fast system with some seared connections to the um, more slow thinking, our mindfulness part of our being. <coughs> So we end up in this aversive looping where something really painful comes up and we have a reaction to it and then, you know, we don't like the self and then we have more reactions and there's this looping and the sense of self gets completely contracted and narrow. We're just identified with the sliver of ourself. We're identified with the angry self, the judgmental self, the needy self, the craving self. So the communication's broken down. Now this is, a, this is what's significant, because I want to, if you can understand that, okay, communication breaks down, it happens in every one of us at times. Whenever you're suffering, there's a communication breakdown. You're caught in a smaller looping in your being. And there's signals for it. I mean, you, know, can, you can sense the signals sometimes that um, it's really the insecure self, the identity is with the insecure self. And um, then we go very up and down with how others perceive us. Because we're insecure, we get very defined and reactive to what others say. We, we believe and disbelieve, you know, we can't trust ourselves really, so we take it in. There was one cartoon I saw of a, um, a gypsy's kind of reading a crystal ball and she's saying to this man, you'll fall for anything. And he's thinking, uncanny. <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> so another sign is that, you know, because we're cut off from our own wholeness, we're living inside the, the fast system and the limbic and we're cut off really from our, our perspective and so on, um, we feel very isolated and there's a sense that I'm alone, I'm the worst, nobody else experiences it like this. You know, n nobody else has things like this happen to them quite so bad. There's the, I, I run into it so often, the sense of, I'm the extreme example of this. And again, a cartoon for you. I had this on my office in my, for many years. There's a little mouse inside a mouse hole, and he's the therapist, uh, you know, and the cat is sitting outside the mouse hole, you know, being the client, and he's looking really dejected. And the uh, therapist is saying, don't worry, fantasies about devouring the doctor are perfectly normal. <laughs> <laughs> so we have ways of getting small and feeling isolated and thinking we're the only one and something's really wrong with us and having others, you know, affect how we experience things. Let's look at the other side. What happens when there's attunement, when there is good communication? How do we relate? So let's say others have mirrored us well. They've let us know their experience of us and they've attended and listened. And we offer that attention inwardly, that mindfulness. So strong emotions arise and there's a sense of listening to their message, not making them wrong. We can say yes to what arises. That doesn't, we can sense real but not true. That, okay, this is a real feeling, but that doesn't mean what it's telling me is true. There's that discrimination because we're listening from a broader perspective. Real but not true. We can send messages back to our more vulnerable parts that guide us. When things go wrong, which they inevitably will, we don't make it about us and we can learn from it. 
So there's a way of relating to imperfection because we're not identified with the bad self or with the wrong self or with the, you know, needy self. Or th- needs can happen. We can make mistakes. We can be um, angry. We can lose our temper. But there's a larger sense of what we are so we can learn. Some of you might remember the back forth when a reporter is interviewing a bank president and he asks him, Sir, what's the secret of your success? And the response from the president is two words. And the reporter says, okay, what? And he goes, right decisions. And how do you make the right decisions? One word. What's that, sir? Experience. And how do you get experience? two words. And what is that, sir? Wrong decisions. <laughs> okay, so here's the principle behind this once again, that if there's communication between the parts and communication between awareness and the different parts of us, you might think of it like an ocean and waves. If the ocean is in relationship with the waves, then there's a way to have perspective and navigate. And what happens is that all the energy of the waves is included. We feel vital, we feel alive, and yet we're not ruled by the particular distorted perceptions that inevitably happen when we're living inside a smaller part of our being. We have a vaster perspective. So there's a sense of access to the vastness of the ocean, that wisdom, but that aliveness of the waves. One of my friends, Rich Simon, says it's like when there's communication, it's like we're a lit up Christmas tree, you know, because everything's firing. It's like when there's communications between the two parts of the brain, that's when we really have access to all our resources. So the challenge is that Communications gets cut off when we go into reactivity and we need to find a way to re-establish communication where the mindful, awake part of us is able to notice what's happening, send messages, listen, respond, re-establish connection between the parts of our being. How do we do it? <laughs> 